Lauren Lee Smith is an actress you might recognize from CSI, Crime Scene Investigation, The L Word, Mutant X, or as Frankie Drake from the CBC television show Frankie Drake Mysteries, which uh, she plays a investigator from 1920s Toronto. How's that for a niche? And she's also Michael Shannon's wife in the movie The Shape of Water. Uh, Guillermo del Toro didn't audition her, he just invited her to be in the movie. We talk about that. The movie's uh, nominated for 13 Oscars this weekend. But when we did the interview, it hadn't come out yet. So I referenced seeing the trailer and we make some jokes about that. We also try to solve some modern day mysteries. And I think what you'll learn is our weird affinity for the book Flowers in the Attic and our theories on aliens. You also find out how dark and crazy I am and what a crybaby she is. This is my new friend. Can she be my friend if I've only spent one hour with her? Lauren Lee Smith. So we are here in the Daily Hive studios, and one of the things, so our production assistant, her name is Loren, and now we are, for, and it was so hard for everyone to learn how to say Loren, and now we have to say Lauren Lee Smith. Do you people know, say your name wrong all the time? First of all, I just have to say, when I was like 13 years old, I tried to convince my entire family and friends to call me Loren, just because it sounded... Like Sophia Loren? Exactly. Yeah, it sounded more exotic than Loren. And so. then what happened? It lasted no for like... On. Oh, no one did. No, no. My, my mom and dad are like, you know. You did not stick to it hard enough. You should have been like, I'm not answering to anything I you say. Have. I should have. I should have committed. I but didn't. <laughs> commitment is key. That's life skills for you right there. Um, okay, so you were telling us that you were here in Vancouver to see family. Yes, I came in. I haven't seen, you know, my brothers and my mom and everyone. Um, well, like everybody's here. My whole family is here. Oh. Yeah, my nephews. So I haven't seen them since uh, April. So I thought, you know, oh, it was time to come and, and say hello to everyone. I'm off to, uh, I go to Iceland on Friday and then on to Berlin uh, a week later. For so, what reasons? For fun. And also my husband is from Berlin. So we're going to go and spend the holidays there. Oh, with his family. With his family. Yes. Which part of Berlin? Is uh, Berlin... We're going to be in Mitte, sort of west, yeah. I don't know why I ask that. Like, I'm like, oh, I'm so familiar. Do you know Berlin? Do I don't know? know. I've never been to Berlin. I've never been to Germany. It was... It's wonderful. Berlin is so much fun. Is it? Yes. Do they, is it a predominantly English-speaking town? Very much so. Oh, because you know what? I hate going to European cities or any cities like South America. I went to Bogota last year or yeah. Bogota. Yeah. They get very mad at me when I say Bogota. They're Bogota. like, eh, outsider. But when you don't speak the language, it is very frustrating. It, want... It's true. It's true. It is. Berlin is great though, because you can pretty much you, you can speak English to everyone. In fact, when I try to speak German, they're like, "Just don't, please don't." Oh, do it. yeah. it's like that's like when I go to Quebec and try to right. speak French. I did French immersion, but when I speak, they're like, uh, "Don't." Mm -mm. I'm going to speak bad English with you rather than listen to your bad French. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like rude. Thank I'm you. not going to talk to you Thank at all. Oh, uh, well, we have an audience. People are like, "Oh, what's going on there?" They're like, "Oh shit, I watch Frankie Drake Mysteries. <laughs> I need an autograph, right?" Yeah. People are like, "What's up?" Uh, bye bye. <laughs> You're like, "No autograph yeah. for you." Uh, so, wait, so the show is not taping right now. You already wrapped it up. Uh, I, I wrapped a week and a half ago. Oh. Yes. You're like, I'm done. I'm going to go on a press tour, and now I'm going to go on vacation. Exactly. I'm going to Iceland to literally unplug. Yeah. Yeah. What, how long did you guys tape the show for? Uh, so we shot for, I guess it was five and a half months. Just okay. about, yeah, five and a half months. All in Toronto or in oh, Hamilton too? A lot of Hamilton. Because Hamilton looks like 1920s Toronto? Exactly. Toronto does not look like 1920s Toronto. But anymore. Hamilton looks like it's 100 years old? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what does that say about Hamilton? And, yeah, yeah. What is the comparison of Hamilton versus Toronto versus Vancouver? Well, do you have a favorite? Can I ask you if you have a favorite? I have favorite no it's a it's a toss-up you know don't get me wrong Hamilton is really lovely and we met some great people but it's pretty rough um it's a, it's a isn't ham uh, st they call it the hammer right exactly is it like a steel industry city yes. still or yes. still like what do you do mine manufacture steel and also like almost every day that we were shooting there there was some sort of like police tape off like crime scene craziness. you guys were shooting in one way and people were shooting in another way it's very much so that's frightening <laughs> so I'm not gonna lie. You shouldn't use that term. You're like, I'm gonna go shoot today. They'd yeah. be like, what? 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 You're like, I mean, I'm gonna record my TV show. Seriously, I, I think if we did not have our 1920s costumes on, like when I'm running with a gun, you know, people will be like, what's happening? Oh <laughs> shit! So like, you guys were like Dick Tracy. Yeah, when I made that Dick Tracy it. reference earlier yeah. about uh, being on camera, if it's not on camera, it's not worth it. Um, you guys had that. What was that like going back in time? Because what are you referencing to be authentic? Are you watching like old vaudeville films and be like, that's how they were in the 20s? 
or old CBC footage? Like, what are you looking at to be like, this is real? This is real. You know, it's really cool. The creators and the director and the DP and everyone, before we started shooting, they put together this sort of like lookbook and everyone could contribute whatever they wanted and just sort of add. And so people would just get inspiration from old photographs or old like little pieces of footage or or um, pieces of literature and everyone could just keep adding this. And we sort of used it as our Bible throughout the entire season, which was really, really cool to have this sort of reference. And someone would, you know, see this one picture and be like, I think this episode should look like this. And then we could sort of have an actual, you know, tangible something to look at and go, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. How's the diversity in the cast? You have a diverse cast, right? So was that even happening in the 20s in Toronto? Or are you guys like taking creative modern day license? We are a little bit. Yeah, we're definitely taking a little bit of creative license, which I'm so proud of the show that they that they did that. I think it's so great. I mean, not only like the first five leads of our show are female, which is pretty cool and pretty unique in itself. But we're all, you know, we're all different colors, all different sizes, all different shapes. And I just love that they that they did that with, with our entire cast. I think it's really, really cool. Why is that important right now, do you think, to be a part of that? Obviously, you don't get to go in there and be like, put me in this show and we're making it this way. But the fact that you are part of that, uh, why is that important in the landscape of what's happening right now, what we see happening in Hollywood, in pop culture, in greater society as well? Yeah, I mean, it was very important in 1921, and it's certainly like, that's that's the really cool thing. It still holds so true t- today. It's very much relevant, you know what I mean? Like, acceptance and um, an acceptance of diversity, and I, I just think that, yeah, the more that we can showcase that, the better. That's really, you know, what it comes down to. How did you prepare for this audition and the role subsequently? Okay, so I'm going to sound like such a snob here. Uh Uh-oh, please. (laughs) We love that. Give me elitism. I'm going to sound like a snob. So I was doing uh, a show for the CBC last year uh, called This Life. And um, it's a show that I really loved, a, a beautiful show. It got canceled. And I literally still had, like, the tears streaming down my face. And then I got a call. Because it got canceled or because your character was a crybaby? Well, both, actually. (laughs) Very much so. Okay. Um, Like, I literally, the same day, I got a call from Christina Jennings, who's the head of Shaftesbury, who I worked with for several years on The Listener. And she called me up and she said, listen, I have this project that I think you'd be great for. Would you, do you want to give it a read? And I said, yeah, of course I want to give it a read. So I read the first five pages and I called her back and I was like, listen, I'm not even halfway through the script, but uh, yeah, yes, let's make this happen. Let's do this. Of course, this is amazing. Um, And so at that point, the scripts hadn't even been written the season, like there was just one script. Um, They didn't even have the full go ahead from CBC yet. Um, And this was in like February and we started shooting in June, which is bonkers for a TV show. This happens for no one. It happens for no one. Oh, we have this role, especially in Canadian television. Right? We have this role. Would you like it? Oh, we're going to start making it right away. Like, dude, I know. It... it, it. (laughs) It's, it's crazy. It's so crazy how it all worked out. It's so crazy how it worked out so quickly and how like sort of everything just fell together and we were able to create this TV series like from conception until our last day of shooting until we were on air under a year, which is almost unheard of. What? Uh, how is it tied in with Murdoch Mysteries? I understand it's like a spinoff or a sequel or like did you appear in one episode and then all of a sudden you're like, no, it's like Denise from The Cosby Show. <laughs> I'm going to go to college. I'm going to go to college Solve now. mysteries. You know, it's funny, everyone, this was sort of this rumor that was going around, oh, it's a, it's a Murdoch spinoff. It's it's absolutely not a Murdoch spinoff. It's not. It's not. What's I, the relation between the two shows? The showrunners are the same. And then the, the word mysteries in exactly. there. Exactly. They're like, mysteries work the first time, exactly. let's do it again. That's it. That's it's, it. it's the creators um, of Murdoch mysteries. I see. But other than that, that's that's really, that's it. It's, it's you know, we're 30 years after Murdoch. Um, I did do an episode of Murdoch a couple of years ago, but it's a very a different, different person. character. It was a different <laughs> Can person. you imagine? I was a different human. Yeah. <laughs> You're like you're like Wonder Woman. You're like yeah, I don't age. Yeah, Frankie yeah. Drake does not age. Frankie Drake does not age. Uh, speaking of Wonder Woman stunts, you had to do some stunts in this uh, in this show. What was the crazy okay. stuff you got to do? How'd you prepare? Okay, so what? so <laughs> what? Oh, let me tell you, I had to get my motorcycle license okay. before we started shooting. I am not did, an adrenaline junkie. Wait, did they have motorcycles in 1920? They did, and they did not wear helmets, and they went very fast, and they were super sketchy motorcycles. <laughs> So you were you were like riding like 1920 style motorcycles. Yes, honestly, I was so terrified when they were like, "Yeah, you know, like your character rides a motorbike." I was like, "Yeah, that's badass! I yeah. can't wait! That's amazing! Wait, it's gonna be me." Uh, okay. <laughs> they didn't offer you a stunt double. Of course, I had a stunt double to do the like the crazy stuff. But yeah. They pretty much insisted that I get my license and get proper training. Which you why? Know, um, I think probably to make it to authentic. Save time. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> to save time. To save time and money. money what? You know, money. Things. That's dangerous. So, so you got trained. Do I you know trained. how to ride a motorbike? I, I do. I Perfect, because we got some lined up right outside. Just can you imagine? <laughs> I literally came <laughs> home from my first my first day with yeah. my instructor. I had yeah. this day. They got me private classes, which was amazing. And I came home crying. I was literally crying because my I feel like you cry like, a lot. Maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning a lot about me. <laughs> <laughs> I think the show got canceled. I'm crying. I'm oh, crying. we got a new show. They want me to ride a bike. I'm, I'm crying. crying. I'm going to go to Berlin. I'm, I'm crying. crying. Everything. It's just emotional. <laughs> but he was like, if you do not get your speed up, mm-hmm. then I cannot pass you. Like everyone else, he said, you know, he's like, you need to slow down. You need to slow down. But me, he's like, can you stop? Like, pu- 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 you need to actually like go a little bit faster if you want to pass your test. You were losing in the uh, Super Mario Kart of life. Yeah, so I put my big girl pants on and I went back the next day and I went faster. And fast. and you got your you got, got your license. license. But if you didn't get your license, then you wouldn't have to do the riding on the show and you'd been fine. It's true. You'd have been less crying. My bosses made me do it. <laughs> the bosses, the shape of water. The shape of water. How did that come about? That's a big deal. It's, were they filming the the movie in Toronto? They were. So you auditioned in Toronto. Okay, again, I'm going to sound like... They did not approach you and be like, do you want to play Michael Shannon's wife? Are you joking me? Okay, but here's... There's some backstory to it. There's some backstory to it. There's some backstory to it before this is like... Where this... It does sound insane. So several years ago, I had met Guillermo... uh, You just met him. For a like different a fan role. Expo? Oh, a different, different role. role. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And... For what? Um, what movie? Do you remember? So it was uh, for The Strain. Okay. And, uh, and I met with him quite a few times and I got the role and then there was a scheduling conflict with something I was doing and I, I had to pull out and it was this whole drama. It was crazy. It was so crazy and I was so heartbroken because I was like, Guillermo del Toro is going to, I'm never going to get to work with him again and this is the saddest day ever. Yes, I cried. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're going to make you cry by the end of this interview. That's right, that's right. So cut to like... Five years later, I get a call. I was in Montreal shooting a series, yeah. and uh, they're like, "So he's shooting this this film. We can't tell you anything about it. It's super top secret, but he's asked if you would come in and, and shoot a couple of days and play Michael Shannon's wife." And I was like, "No audition." What? What? Wow. Yeah, insane. That is insane. So insane. Super grateful. <laughs> super grateful, but crazy insane. Yeah. And so what was that experience like? Okay, have you seen the trailer? I'm sure you've seen the trailer. Seen that the is a trailer. messed up trailer. Because I, I didn't know what this movie was about. And I was like, what? I was like, oh, Octavia Spencer. She's playing like futuristic The Help. And then I'm like, oh, no, that's not what this nope. movie is. Nope, quite different. <laughs> quite different. Very different. Yes. Yes, oh, my is. goodness. The trailer, I was like, the whole time my face was like. I know. And I'm right? like, what is happening? Yeah. yeah. He's very much going back to the whole sort of like Pan's Labyrinth type mm-hmm. storytelling, which um, he kind of veered from for a while there. But um, yeah, it's very much fantasy. It's, I mean, at the core, what the story is, it's a love story. Like ultimately, that's what the film is. It's a love story between um, a creature and uh, a very peculiar young woman. And um, and it's kind of a, a love story about acceptance again, which is, it's 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 really beautiful movie. Like it's a super beautiful, touching, emotional movie. Um, is it the print? They're like, is. but the trailer makes it look like it's some like kind of crazy action movie. It does. Starring Octavia Spencer. Starring Octavia Spencer. Yeah. No, I mean, there's definitely action elements. Yeah. In it, but like, ultimately, I think what what will surprise people the most and why it has has received the recognition that it has so far is because like. You, you sort of, you take away the fact that he's this like seven foot lizard man. You take away the fact that... <laughs> people don't know. They're like... <laughs> well, it's in the tra- It is in the... It's in the trailer. Part. But it if, is. If it people is. just listening to this are like, they're we like, don't know what wait, this movie is. What? Oh, I what? know. And then there's this, this very <laughs> intense, deaf, mute woman. And somehow they come together and have this like insane love, which... I, have you seen the film? I have. Did you cry? I feel from the trailer, it's got like emotional, like it it heft to it. it. So I'm not. If you don't get teary eyed in this film, there's something wrong with you. Then you're you're the seven foot creature in your heart, dead inside. Even though he's a nice guy from the trailer, he looks like he he seems like a really nice merman. He's a lovely merman. Might want to hang out with him. No judging. Um, (laughs) Vancouver, you were born here. I was. Left at what age? Um, Well, I left very early on. My parents were like. 
weird hippies that like tr- they traveled the world and they brought their three children around the world with them and thought that a part of a good education would be living in different places and moving every six months to a year. Did you learn so, a lot? Uh, yeah, yeah, I learned so much. I learned how to pack a suitcase. Yeah, <laughs> real quick. <laughs> Did you cry a lot when you moved? Uh, probably. <laughs> probably. I mean, that's what uh, happened. I pro- probably did. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think we left when I was like four or five. Okay. Um, How often do you come back here then? I come back quite often. I bought um, I bought a house here about 15 years ago out in the Fraser Valley. Um, Does somebody live in it? My mother lives there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I told you, you just bought a house and it's unoccupied. Yes. This is why there's a housing crisis. Cool. Thank you. It's cool. Yeah. You know. <laughs> My mom lives there. Okay. That's very nice of you. And we come back, yeah, many, many times a year. Wait, we're in the Fraser Valley. In Cultus Lake. Wait, that's like far out. That's like resort area. It is. So yeah. what do what do you love about Cultus Lake? It's it's like in the summer everyone knows it because obviously of the lake and the water slides and everything that's there. But I love it in the winter. It's so deserted and quiet. It's like a little. I literally like. There's a street close to mine called Sleepy Hollow Drive. It's like living in a horror movie. Oh. It's. I thought but, you were going to say like some cute small town, but horror movies. No, cute. I mean, it's why like, like a horror movie? Like you walk down the street and, and you're like, deserted, someone's going to kill me. And there's like no one around and it's super quiet and peaceful. And like, there's no one is hiring you to be the tourism spork- spokesperson. <laughs> Come to Cultus Lake. <laughs> you might die. Oh, <laughs> uh, do they have cute shops there? That's where I love going to small towns. I'm like, look at these cute shops yeah. of stuff I'm never going to buy. There's but it's cute. literally this pizza place called Beethoven's Pizza that has been there since I was born. Oh. It's still there and it's still amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, hopefully it has good pizza. It's really good pizza. For 30 years, 30 something years. But like, figure out your recipe. You Make it good. You would think so, right? What, uh, do you spend a lot of time in the city then here in Vancouver? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I go what's back your, and forth. What's your favorite stuff to do here? What's my favorite stuff to do here? I mean, just obviously going like walking around the seawall is amazing. Yeah, I think, I think. even on a rainy day like this. I, even on a rainy oh, day like this. Really? Yeah. Put on like a slicker it. and an umbrella. And just... I feel like if you don't embrace the rain here, then you're kind of screwed. Like you gotta right. just love it. You, you have to. Otherwise, you're just gonna be miserable and cry all the time. So. Right. Right. Which is what, like what you do a lot. <laughs> cry, cry, cry. Actually, you know what? I just realized I wanted to ask you something about um, the shape of water. When you finally got to talk with Gear, oh, when you finally got to work with Guillermo yeah. del Toro. What was that experience like? And what did he ever tell you what it was that when he cast you in The Strain all those years ago that had you sitting in the back of his mind for a potential opportunity? I mean, he did. He, I never asked him that because I feel like, I'm like mm. but no, I mean, he really? Just, yeah, no, he just I would have been like, dude, what? Why what? did you remember Why did me? Why did you remember me? He did. But say. like in a casual, we're like at the craft table and you're like, hey, that's so nice that you thought of me. What? Well, I did. And he's oh. like, I told you we would work together at some point. And I was like, oh my gosh, the fact that Guillermo del Toro is saying these things to me is just beyond. Yeah. Um, but working with him is like, it's it's an actor's dream. He's this he's this visionary director who, um, he, who, who knows exactly what he wants, but he also, he, he lets you play. And he just has so many, in, you kind of just have to trust him because it's like, how do you go into a film with that premise and go, hmm, oh, this, yeah, cool, I get it. Right. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. kind of just have to, to know that he's this, like, insanely talented filmmaker and just go, yeah, I trust you. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And uh, and and that's that's how it goes. And he's just, like, this big teddy bear. He's lovely. He's, like, the sweetest man ever. The sweetest man have the craziest ideas. Yeah. yeah. In a good way. Come on. In, In a, a good, really way. good way. Uh, Michael Shannon plays a bit of a sadistic man in this film. He does. In the trailer, he looks messed up and angry. It's terrifying. What's it like playing his wife then? It was terrifying. Oh, it was. It was. It wasn't like his. He was like nice husband, crazy office man. He was just crazy all the time. He's really intense. He's probably one of the most intense actors I have ever worked with. Like as a character, or as a human too, like as an actor person. Well, I think he sort of stays in character. That's he seems to stay into character. So you don't know Michael Shannon. You just know the character that Not he played. Really. Yeah, he oh. came. Like we had a little bit of a chat. Um, you know, in between takes, we would chat, but he, he stayed pretty intense, I think, for his for his role. He maybe that's what he needed to do, like to stay in it. But yeah, it was in, it was he was intense. And our scenes together are very um, volatile and very difficult to watch, sort of. And he he kept that up. And we have children in the film as well. And I think I think legit those kids were like, I think he he really did scare them. <laughs> Oh, yeah. But it's really, it's like I'm making it sound horrible, but it's actually quite <laughs> exciting to work with an actor like that because you have no idea what to expect and you have no idea what's going on. You just kind of go, okay, uh, let's go for it. Whoa. Did you cry? 
I did not. You did not? Nope. Did you have any crying scenes in the movie? Nope. Oh, yeah. this is a yeah. big departure for you. Yeah, Life changing. Oh, my together. goodness. Um, okay, so let's talk about modern day mysteries. Right. So you were the star of Frankie Day Mysteries, and I wanted to see how much of when you play a role yeah. that translates to other areas of your life. So I want to present some mysteries to you and see how you would solve them. Okay. So the first one is, how do you know if your man is cheating on you? Or your woman, or your whatever. How do you know if your like how would you figure it out? If lover someone is, is yeah. cheating on you, yeah. Instincts. I think you just know. I mean, really? Yeah, I feel. I feel like. Well, I hope so. <laughs> and how would you prove it? How would you prove? Yeah, it? sleuthing skills. How do we track I mean, that down? You need to get a hold of their phone first yeah. of all. That's number one. You need to get a hold of their phone. You need to go through the text. Yes. Um, Any tips for cracking passwords? Um, yeah, I think that more, I think people tend to go much more simple than, than <laughs> at least everyone I know. Right. It's like, they're always like, pick some crazy elaborate. No, oh, I think you forget it. super simple. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So like I would, you know, try birthdays or yeah, that's I, honestly, I think it's, I think it's more simple. Oh, what about thumbprints? Have you tried that? Tried what? Like trying to like oh, unlock the, somebody's phone with their thumbprint if they're like sleeping. If it actually, yeah. Oh, oh my right. gosh, that's a great idea. There you go. I'm gonna. Hey. I'm gonna start writing for Frankie, Frankie, Frankie Drake, Drake Mysteries. <laughs> in 1920, in 100 years from now, this is how you will solve mysteries. <laughs> They'll be like, "What? This is a plot what? departure." Um, next one. Uh, if someone's gonna throw a surprise birthday party for you, how do you find out where they're gonna take you? How do you find out? Well. So someone tried to throw a surprise birthday party for me one time, and it was so lame, like literally so lame. I the party was lame, or like their surprise no, I was lame. Knew the whole time, and I had to pretend that I didn't. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, my husband was like, "Oh, we're just gonna go down the street for dinner, and and it'll be great. We're just gonna stop at, at our friend's house real quick and pick them up." I was like, "No, we're <gasps> not. Stop it right now." Um, what about engagement? Did you know your husband was going to engage to you? How do you uh, figure out someone's going to propose to you? Well, how do you figure out? Maybe they start like sweating profusely. <laughs> oh, I'm sweating in this room. Uh, it's I mean, hot I'm, in this room, though. I know, though, though, it's super hot. Because of these nice lights. I know, it's going to, we're trying to make us look beautiful. That's right. It's just sitting in the dark no. fluorescence. No thanks. <laughs> it's all about the ego and the aesthetics. But no, we're sweating. But no, yeah. yeah, we're sweating. Uh, yeah, I think that, that people, I think because it's like if you're nervous and... I don't know. I think my husband started sweating, and I was like, "What's up with you?" Oh, yeah. And then what happened? And then he proposed. You got really sweaty and proposed. Got really sweaty and proposed. That was attractive. You were like, "Mm." like, "I guess." Blot that. (laughs) Blot that. Um, Aliens. Do they exist? They better. Do you think they exist? I think they exist. Do you know what the Fermi paradox is? No. Oh shit! I was hoping you did. Um, The Fermi paradox. Loosely, anybody listening is going to be like, "That's not what it is." But what it loosely is is. If aliens exist, yeah. and I believe they do, because we cannot be the only life forms. No way. Look at how many different life forms are on this planet alone. How can we be the only ones in the universe? The question is, why have we not found them, or why have they not contacted us? Okay. That's the Fermi. I'm gonna look it up right now. But what's your theory on that? I'm so, gonna look it up right okay, now. Okay, but do you think? Do you believe in any like of the the people who are like I've been abducted, or I've they've come to visit me, or do you believe in any of that? Uh, I do. Yeah. I do too. I because do. I feel like those people who say these things don't seem to be that creative. I mean, I don't think they're that smart to make all this up. I don't think so either. Uh, not I don't to think so either. not to denigrate them further than I just did, but I feel like that's really creative and really scientific to not. Have that be true. I, I agree. hundred percent. I agree. The Fer- Fermi paradox. Okay. So the idea is like, where is everybody? Um, it's named after physicist Enrico Fermi. It's the apparent contradiction between the lack of evidence and high probability estimates that there are other extraterrestrial civilizations. Hmm. According to this line of reasoning, the earth should have already been visited by ET in an informal conversation. Fermi noted no convincing evidence of this leading to ask, where is everybody? Though there have been many attempts to explain the Fermi paradox, um, blah, 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 blah. It's the same shit. Okay, so maybe I was right. Um, yeah, why have we not... My theory... Yeah. Well, we do have a theory to solve well, that mystery. Why I, they haven't... I, if they exist, why we haven't heard from them? I think they have. 
have. You think they have? I 100% have. And you think the government's hiding it? I do. The American government? I do. There's that one guy, that one Canadian guy who's like, no, it's happened. Have you seen that YouTube thing? This old guy, he's like retired. He's like, I know, it's happened. Here's the proof. Was he the one who, like, his house was like, he's been visited many, many, many No, he was like like a government official. Oh. Yeah. And he's like, no, I've seen the proof. Oh. But he talks to like a, you know. Like. I'm I'm angry and I'm going to tell the truth, but no one's going to listen to me because I'm old and like you think I'm senile now. No, I think they're here, but we're just so like think of it. Even with the show yeah. Frankie Drake Mysteries in 1920, if you went to somebody and said, "I have a little thing the size of a, I don't know what was this big in 1920, but it could take pictures and you could talk to people and you could type things like on a typewriter and it would give you all the information you want in the world," people would be like. Are you the devil? You are crazy. Right. Yeah. So I just think that our civilization has not evolved to understand what is there. Because what was that movie? Oh, what was that one with um, Matthew McConaughey? Remember the one? Interstellar. Oh, And yeah, it was yeah. like so weird. It was like about the fifth dimension. Yeah. I just think that we have not achieved in that consciousness. All of it is like we are going inwards. Right. Right. And we have not achieved that. Like I think if an alien saw us, like remember the movie Contact with yeah. Amy Adams? Yeah. Yeah. They saw us. They'd be like, these weird humanoids communicate by flapping their meat. <laughs> Whereas, like, we just look and, like, you can sense. It's you know everything. when you said about instinct? Mm-hmm. You know if someone's cheating on you. You can sense that. Right. They probably just operate on this higher intuition right. where we're just really primitive. Right. How we look at ants or other stuff and, like, oh. That's so, yeah. yeah. You know? They They're probably think of us the same going, way. Mm. No, they waste of time. Even, they don't even have a clue. They don't right. even have a clue. Yeah. yeah. I, I or they don't even think of us. They're like, we're ants to them. And like, right. well, whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's really sad and depressing. Um, <laughs> the pyramids. I watched a special on CBC with David Suzuki okay. explaining how the pyramids came about. And? I don't believe it. So I think tell me, it was, tell me, tell me, what does David Suzuki say? Because I feel like he knows a lot. Yeah, he does know a lot, but he didn't say it. So he was presenting the information yeah. that these people would cut these slabs of stone and then like roll them down the Nile River and build it with like all these blocks. Yeah. How would you explain the existence of the pyramids based on what you know and what you think you know? I mean, I feel, how would I? Th- they're magic. That's so. Really? <laughs> I think so. I mean, that's just crazy. Oh, well, I think it was aliens. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like it's. Oh, like so you think magic. aliens are magic? So, well, a little bit. Well, it's Frankie Drake mysteries, not Frankie Drake science hour. <laughs> so you can take some liberties. <laughs> magic. I mean, no, I don't think there's any sort of logical way to to uh, describe them. As much as I love David Suzuki, I I think that's like. I mean, how long would that possibly take? Think about how long it took to like build cathedrals. Like that is some next level. Think how long it takes to fix an intersection when they're just putting in a bike lane. I'm like, if it takes that like a whole like summer to do that, how the hell are they going to build a pyramid? Build a pyramid. God, union rules. Aliens. Aliens are just like, yeah, boom. There you go. A more modern day mystery. Um, Flight 370, Malaysian Airlines. It's so creepy. Yeah, what do you think happened there? And how do we so go about creepy. figuring out what happened there? I think it just crashed, and it's so I think it's <laughs> terrible. I'm so like I should I'm, laugh. Why are you laughing? It's terrible. <laughs> this is the moment where we cry. No laughing. Do you think something crazy happened? I think it just I think it exploded and into a thousand little tiny pieces, and that's it. Oh. I know. I wish I had. Maybe maybe the aliens took it to it's, for the an experiment. Aliens. Again, it's all about the aliens. Could be. I mean, that's that. I prefer to think of it that way. It's yeah. way morbid. Let's bring it back to modern day in the office. <laughs> okay. How do you after that after that question? This is gonna be edited out. <laughs> so morbid. They're like those people are horrible. So many people lost their lives. You don't know. They could be living on an island lost. They I could mean, be like hanging out with where Amelia Earhart went. You know, when she went down, she didn't right. die. She I saw die. recently a picture of her, and they're like, she was like living on an island somewhere in like um, near Papua New Guinea. I don't even know where Papua New Guinea is. <laughs> Just like in that area. <laughs> but she's in Papua New Guinea. She's hanging out, drinking Mai Tai. I saw a photo. It was her and some white dude, and then a bunch of uh, like, natives to the island were there. And I'm she like, who took that photo? She fell in love with someone. She like had a crash landing, but made it. So yeah. Love. She's like, I'm like, fine. I'm living the life here. I'm good. And they got pineapple juice. I'm good. <laughs> I'm hydrated. Um, if someone is stealing your food from the office fridge, how do you figure out who it is and how do you stop them? That's a real mystery that you could help us solve. Real mis- Does that happen here? 
So, well, it was suggested by somebody here, so I think it must have. Because when I put it out, I'm like, we need some mysteries, modern day mysteries. And someone suggested that. And I was like, does that happen? Because I've left food there so long that it's gone bad. So I'm like, no one's stealing my food. Probably you need, I'm not. Some, you need to, to install some cameras is what you need to do and find who that culprit is. Who's stealing the food. And then what? And then you you steal their food right oh, really? back. Oh, see, that's... Eye for an eye. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, I would have been like... Remember that book, Flowers in the Attic? Yes. I was like, I would put our stick in the sugar dough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe we take it down like a notch <laughs> okay, maybe and I'll... just like sprinkle it with a whole... Just laxatives. Just, just laxatives. Some, laxatives. <laughs> some laxatives. I'll give you that. That's that's fine. A little... <laughs> Oh, that's so let's dark. Just poison them to death. <laughs> and then when they're dead, you know, that's who stole my lunch. Oh my Take that, bitch. Oh my God. But that book, <laughs> wow, that book scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. But I read it like 15 times. But you so it did. Must have, I did. And I read the whole series. And I, I don't do. really remember it because so I don't remember weird. things about The brother well. and the sister and the incest it was so weird anyways you're dark and that's cool <laughs> you did not realize this i did not know we'd go there um uh, but let's talk about being an artist let's totally segue out of my crazy and into it's like so obviously before people would just approach you and hand you movies and tv series there was a process yes. what do you think was the greatest support for you in that process in like I guess in the the struggle or was there ever struggle like when did you decide to become an actress yeah no I mean I I decided to become an actress when I was seven years old and I watched oh. Labyrinth <laughs> I watched I saw David Bowie and I was like wait were there yeah. like puppets in that movie yes Jim Hens- Jim Henson it was literally puppets that puppets maybe- and David Bowie and that inspired you to become an actress Dude, that was it for me what what did you relate to that that you're like David Bowie puppets i will now become a performer i have no idea i'm super weird i guess but like most people are like oh, i was inspired by audrey hepburn or you know whoever yeah. i'm like no you I, were like fraggle rock i was like fraggle rock jim henson is yeah. my jam and i, I just age. like remember watching this as a kid like that and then dark crystal and never ending story and i was just like i want to be parts of those worlds like that's cool that's fun and that's make-believe land so when i was seven i was like i want to be an actor and my mom was like what what is how do you even do that um so i just did like a a bunch of theater growing up as a kid wherever we lived i would sort of go into a little theater program and then um and then when i was 17 i moved back to vancouver and um and started taking classes started taking classes and started you took classes audition. here in Vancouver I did With yeah. who? Um, I went to the the Gastown Actors Studio for a while but it was really um, a man named Andrew McElroy who's still around who really yes and he is the the, like he changed everything for me shut up why and how training with him is when I started working he just it made sense to me the way oh, that he that's yeah the way that he could explain walking in like walking into an audition room and how to to break down material and how to sort of to to find characters and how to audition actually which is so useful for an actor you don't totally. you know what i mean like that's what you need to an know actor's to do. job is auditioning more than it is acting exactly and if you don't have that process down if you don't know how to walk into a room and do you know take direction mm. then it's, it's not going to happen unless you know you're super duper lucky but um, yeah, he was the one for me that sort of just clicked and made sense. And um, so I studied with him for a few years. And, and, uh, and I, I think it's honestly because of him that I started working. What are your best tips for auditioning? So this is the thing. I usually get sent out to play reporter. Okay. Back when I, because I went to theater school. Yeah. I went to UBC on a computer science scholarship. And after one semester, I yeah. switched to theater. Okay. And I feel like I'm a stronger director and a producer. But... Um, Back then, like in the early 2000s, I'd get sent out for cab driver and terrorist. So now it's like cab driver, terrorist, and reporter oh, because okay. of my career. But I feel like auditioning, like it's just such a difficult thing. What are your tips for being able to audition successfully? Yeah, I, I still to this day, auditioning is not my favorite. I really, it's not, I, I, I don't like it. Hmm. But um, I think being able to take your time and not rush to walk because I think what happens is you get really nervous and people walk into rooms and they just want to get out as as quickly as possible and do what they had prepared Um, and the minute you can sort of walk in 
take a deep breath and ground yourself and actually listen to what the casting director or the producers or the director is telling you um, and absorb that and like understand that then the better chance you have I think at least for me anyways you would sort of I would go in and, and I would have this idea of what I wanted to do and the minute someone would tell me to do something differently it would be I, I would get really nervous and sort of clam up a little bit um, but no I think it's really just about sort of grounding yourself and, and taking a moment and really truly listening I mean that's the whole sort of basis of acting in, in my opinion is listening and then reacting um, and so that sort of I think goes it, it's the same with with listening to your director and being able to take direction actually fully understanding what they're saying and, and listening and then reacting Breakdowns and breakthroughs. When in this career, why are you laughing? No, I love that. That hard transition. I love it with the with the mic. It sounded so good. <laughs> and the segment title comes up. Yeah. When in your career, and obviously because we know you're very prone to crying, so I'm sure there's lots of opportunities of this. But when do you feel that you had a breakdown that led to a breakthrough? Were they one and the same? Were they two different things? Um. I feel like there's sort of all, all different sort of markers throughout my career, but a really big one for me um, was a I was doing a, a series and I knew that it wasn't really the type of of material that I was proud of and wanted to put out there. And I was super grateful to have the experience and to be working, but I also felt creatively really sort of stuck. And after um, two seasons, uh, it I, I moved on. And uh, so that was really, really difficult to sort of come to terms with that and, and, and realize that. And then, um, and then something presented itself to me in a new opportunity in a film um, called Lie With Me, which was the first film that, that I ever did. And it was like this crazy... Um, super sexual, interesting character piece, and I sort of I had to like bear myself physically and emotionally, and that to me was a huge breakthrough. Um, Why? And well, it's 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 pretty daunting being completely nude on camera. You know, it's pretty crazy, but it's also extremely freeing. And there was something in that that for me sort of opened me up to be able to put away a lot of my fears and a lot of my insecurities and that to me sort of um, yeah opened up I think my abilities to um, to try new things and to really go outside of myself and experiment and and feel comfortable with um, yeah with with going outside of my comfort zone what did your mother and cultists like think about this nudie scene she was not that happy no but I took her to the premiere okay and uh, and ultimately she was really proud of me I mean I made my whole family watch I was like my brothers was like my brothers were, were not impressed at all but I was like come <laughs> on family because to me like I would never do something even though I am nude in the film yeah. I would never do something that I wouldn't be comfortable showing my family. They may not be comfortable watching, right. but I was comfortable with them seeing it. So, um, yeah, no, still to this day. My mom is always like, just do something where you keep your clothes on. Do you take your clothes off in Frankie Drake? No, I don't. So keep then thanks. Clothes. There you go, my mom. My mom loves it. Headlining yes. the show, and I ain't and naked. I'm just doing clothes. just doing dangerous um, <laughs> motorcycle stunts. Were you just singing like a Whitney Houston rendition I of what? I was. Like, I'm every woman. Um, what is, um, what was the smartest thing you did in your career? Oh, wow. the smartest thing. Um, I think the smartest thing I ever did in my career was come back from the U.S. And What do you mean? Uh, well, like you went to L.A. to make it? I did, you know, like all actors in Vancouver are told they mm -hmm. need to sort of go to LA to to work and um, and so I followed suit and I went down for every pilot season and every time I was down there I, I kept getting work back in Canada and I was like this is ridiculous why am I <laughs> why am I fighting to be here um, and to, to sort of make this life when I keep working in Canada and keep getting wonderful opportunities in Canada I'm working with incredible directors um, doing material that I'm super proud of, why don't I just sort of go, yeah, no, I'm okay with this. And I think once I did that, everything sort of fell into place. And, you know, I've, I've been doing this now for 20 years, and um, and I haven't had to have another job. You know what I mean? And that's, that's, that's pretty great. 
That is really good. Yeah. Well, what advice would you give somebody um, to succeed? Because obviously when I think like, say if I'm listening to your story right now, I'm going to be like, okay, so she took some class with Andrew McElroy. And the reason I kind of like perked up about that is because people told me the same thing. Oh, great. But then I like went and like took like, because you know, he doesn't teach all the classes. So yeah. his beginner one is like taught by somebody else. And I'm oh. like, this is terrible. Oh, I, well, I just feel it's like if the teacher talks too much, yeah. it's not for me. Okay. I'd rather like when I get an opportunity, I just hire a private coach yeah. to help me with that situation. And that sometimes works for me, you know, yeah. but I just don't want to sit through classes of other people like trying to figure out their craft. That's okay. not for me. But that totally aside for you okay so you've had that you have people offering you roles people can be like well she's just lucky but what would you recommend for people who want to succeed as an artist not just an actor but as an artist what could you say based on your experiences that they could emulate to do well I think you have to have really thick skin. I think, you know, rejection is a huge part of being any kind of artist. Um, and you have to just sort of, you have to, to, to build up that resilience. And um, I always say when, you know, young people are like, oh, what, what advice do you have? It's like, you also have to want this more than anything else because it's, it's such an all-consuming job and you have to sort of, everything you do is up to someone else. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not that I can just say, oh, I want to work. I want to go to work. You know what I mean? It's dependent on whoever's going to hire me. And then, um, and then those, uh, the producers and then the writers and then the, the executives. So you have to sort of be extremely flexible and, and it's, it's a crazy industry and it's really, really tough and there is a lot of rejection. So I think you have to be resilient. You have to want this more than anything else. Um, if there's something else you're super passionate about and you, you can envision yourself doing, follow that path. Like, and I know that sounds terrible, but I, I think it's true. Like for me, there was never a question. There was never a question of, of anything else I wanted to do. It was this and that was it. Um, and I also think, um, yeah, like classes, whatever works for you, whatever type of class works for you, it's super important getting that sort of on camera experience because people tend to do really weird things if they're not used to being on camera. You know, they, they have little quirks and stuff that maybe work in person or in a photograph, but on camera can be like really, really weird. Yeah. And that can sort of make all of the difference of, of you know, whether you're getting a callback or not, if you're twitching your eyebrow or doing that weird thing that, I mean, I had that for a long time. I had this like eyebrow that would always like go up and then it was pointed out to me, I believe by Andrew McElroy, uh, and saying you, you need to tame to that it? down. You need to tame that down. <laughs> Heart swells and mind expansions. Yeah. What is it that you're excited about that opens your heart up? That you know that feeling when you're like, oh my God. Or, and when you hear about this idea, a book, a movie, a something you consume, and it just like blows your mind, opens your mind. Tell me about those things to wrap this up. Heart swells and mind expansions. Mind expansions. I always get excited about things that are... uh, uh, going back to what we were saying before, but things that completely take me out of my comfort zone. You know, like I was joking about it before, but having to get my motorcycle license, that's something that I wouldn't do in my normal day-to-day life. Um, But being given the opportunity to do that, to play a role, because that's what the character does, I think that's pretty incredible. Or, you know, delving into... anything that's sort of outside of myself. I'm a pretty light-hearted person, except for the crying fits. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So I've always sort of been attracted to, you know, the darker things or the edgier things um, in, in humankind. And so those are the things that always sort of get, get me excited is, is having an opportunity to explore those avenues. And, um, and also, I have a daughter now, and that sort of opened my mind to everything else. I've always, I've always been very selfish when deciding what I want to do next and the roles that I like. It's really sort of a selfish process of, okay, what haven't I tried yet? Or what's very different from what I just came off of? And suddenly, having a one-and-a-half-year-old daughter, I'm suddenly looking at things like when Frankie Drake came along. I was like, oh, my God this is something that, you know, down the road she would be proud of and something that she could watch. I've never really had that sort of thought process before. So in in terms of my career, so it was really interesting to sort of have that experience go, oh, wow, yeah, I guess I'm actually starting to to think about things through her eyes and what kind of, yeah, what what do I want to put out there um, for a young woman to see? 
Do you have a website? I don't. No. Don't. I don't have a website. No. We need a place to direct people to. Girl, you need a website. <laughs> so you better check laurenleesmith.com. <laughs> dot ca. Dot ca. I have Canadian. a I have a Twitter and an Instagram. You don't own those. No, that's true. To own your site. The Shape of Water. Go see that movie because you're going to get messed up and then you're going to fall in love with like an underwater creature and be like, love story meant to be. It's like a modern day Little Mermaid. It's a modern day Little Mermaid. <laughs> little <laughs> Merman. <laughs> Is that how Guillermo pitched it to you? Oh Why don't you mean this movie? It's like... It's like uh, Little Mermaid meets... The Help. The Help. <laughs> well... I am never going to get hired by him again. No. <laughs> it's all my fault. It's all my crazy and dark. That's what happened. You're like, okay. You're going to be like, thanks, Robin. And my friend Zane, he's psycho. <laughs> Thank you for joining us and answering all these questions. Thank you for having That's me. That's awesome. We solved a lot of mysteries. We did. Did we really, though? No. I think I really just told you uh, what I think about aliens. And to and poison we... your coworkers. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> forgot about that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you. The Shape of Water is still in theater, so you can see that. Frankie Drake Mysteries hopefully will be coming back for a second season. And in the meantime, go to dailyhive.com to find out more information on where you can follow Lauren and connect with her. Because like I said, she, despite being a crybaby, is joy incarnate. Oh, and as for the podcast, rate, review, and subscribe. Let us know what you think. And let me know what you think about The Shape of Water. Or if aliens exist, because we can talk about that forever.